All right, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the second AAAS AMS invited address. My name is Ken Ono, and I am the uh, retiring chair of Section A. This is the mathematics section of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. AAAS is the largest general scientific society in the world, and our goal is to advance science, engineering, and innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all people. Through our work, jointly with the American Mathematical Society, uh, we have launched a new uh, series of invited addresses. This is the second AAAS AMS invited address. Last year was the inaugural address given quite brilliantly by Kavita Ramanan of Brown. And today it's our pleasure to bring to you a, our first in-person, in-person invited address. It's my distinct pleasure to say that we have a dis very distinguished speaker today and a very distinguished introducer. And so what's a little bit out of ordinary is that I get to introduce the introducer. Congressman Jerry McNerney, a PhD mathematician, was first elected to Congress in 2006, and the 110th Congress uh, was his very first. He retired at the, at the end of the 117th term, I guess a week or two ago. Probably, he's probably really glad that he retired uh, <laughs> last week. And he had a very distinguished career. He served four U.S. presidents, George Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and uh, Joe Biden. After receiving his PhD in mathematics, he served several years as an engineer with Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico. Uh, and prior to his election to Congress, he formed a startup company uh, that manufactured wind turbines. During his career in wind en energy, Congressman McNerney's work contributed to saving the equivalent of approximately 30 million barrels of oil, oil or, or 8.3 million tons of carbon dioxide. I have uh, many more things that I could say about how important Congressman McNerney has been to the citizens of the United States, promoting innovation and science to the greater world. Um, and, but I will spare you all of that so that we can quickly get to our distinguished lecture. But I do want to thank, and I think we, we owe uh, Congressman McNerney uh, a round of applause for all the good that he has done. And I'm delighted to say that he now serves on one of the AMS important policy committees. So his service certainly continues. Professor Congressman McNerney. Well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's my honor and privilege this morning to be introducing the next invited speaker who has a uh, resume and a CV that uh, is quite enviable. I certainly envy it, uh, and I'm really uh, honored to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Philip Manny. Uh, he is the inaugural professor of mathematics, mathematical biology um, at and director of the Wilson Center for Mathematical Biology. Mathematics Institute, Oxford University. He is a fellow of the Royal Society, a fellow of the UK Academy of Medical Sciences, a SIAM fellow, and was recently elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has also won a number of prizes, including the London Mathematical Society Naylor Prize and the Society for Mathematical Biology Arthur Winfrey Prize, his research focuses on mechanistic models for tissue level behavior in developmental biology, wound healing, and cancer. Dr. Manny? So thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So well, thank you for that kind introduction. And um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here um, speaking to you today. So I'm going to talk about um, modeling collective cell movement in biology and medicine. And as you know, collective movement um, occurs at many different spatial scales. Probably the, the most spectacular one are, are um, the flocks of starlings and birds that one sees. There's also fish schools, 
whales, etc., and it goes right down to cells. And there are really, broadly speaking, two types of collective movement in cells. There are cells that are um, very tightly bound to each other, so they move in a sheet. And there are cells that are loosely bound. And the latter are the ones I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about them in the context of developmental biology, and then also briefly in the context of cancer. So this is work that's been done with um, Paul Kalesa and his group. Um, Paul recently moved from the Stowers Institute for Medical Research to um, University of Notre Dame, and with a number of colleagues, um, both um, faculty, Ruth Baker, and then also um, a number of graduate students. Um, thank you. Um, Louise Dyson, Lina Schumacher, Raza Ganuati, and Duncan Martinson, and my colleague Helen Byrne. So neural crest is basically a group of cells that um, have to go somewhere to do their thing, basically. And they're very important in forming parts of our body. And the ones we're looking at are cranial neural crest, which form this part uh, of the body. So the, the sort of jaw, lower chin. Um, and what we see here is there's, there's the head and down to the tail. And these cells, they move along these corridors, OK? And the reason for studying these is that there are many neural crest-related diseases. And in fact, one third of developmental diseases occur due to something going wrong with neural crest. And another thing is that their behavior is very, very similar to that of some of the most invasive cancers. And it's an experimentally tractable and powerful paradigm model for understanding collective movement. And this, this was a, a sort of article in which we um, did a sort of review of that. OK? Now, invasive cell motion has been widely studied. And um, we can now have our first advert break. Uh, later on this year, we're running a six-month course or a program at the Newton Institute in Cambridge, University of Cambridge, and on the mathematics of movement. And what we're going to try and do there, we've arranged a number of workshops, so you, you can sign up to come to them. And the idea is to bring people that work in all different areas of movement, ranging from animal down to cell biology, to exchange knowledge, but also to try and see, are there common processes going on? And later on today and all of tomorrow, here there will be um, sessions going on as well in the Back Bay A room in the Sheraton. OK? So there are different neural crests, and they have different ways of doing this movement. So one example is the gut. So in, in your gut, the gut is growing in the embryo, and cells have to delaminate from the neural crest and move along and cover that area. And if they don't, it leads to something called Hirschsprung's disease. And there's some very nice work by Kerry Landman, Matt Simpson, and Don Newgreen. What they did was it's natural to think that if these cells don't reach the end of the boundary, there must be something wrong with their movement. And what they showed, using the Fisher-type reaction fusion equation, which they validated with experiments, is that it really is a Fisher-type movement. So therefore, proliferation is also important. So that it could be that if things aren't working out, it's because of proliferation, not because of um, movement problems. Now, the cranial neural crest, there's virtually no proliferation. So we can't use their model. 
Then in, in Xenopus and the Frog, there's a model put forward by Roberto Maior and his colleagues, and it's called contact inhibition and co-attraction. And I view this as mathematician at a party. Okay, so if you're a mathematician at a party, you go up to talk to someone, and they find out you're a mathematician, they move away from you, and then you move closely to them to tell them how important mathematics is. They move away further, you move back to them, say, oh, prime numbers, Turing instability, fantastic, move forward, traveling waves, all the and in the process, you move along, okay? Um, and so they came up with a model like that, an individual cell-based model, and uh, work by Kevin Painter and, and various colleagues have looked at um, writing down an uh, integral differential equation for that with non-local interaction terms. And then you can get all sorts of patterns in this. And this is good for having a pulse of cells moving along. And unfortunately, it's not good for what we're looking at because we have streams moving along. Okay, so this is what we're going to look at, back to here. So the top, this is the chick, top is head, bottom is tail. We're looking at rhombomer 4, and these are cells that will move to something called branchial arch 2, BA2. And when they get there, they will then differentiate and form the structures. Okay? So that distance is one millimeter. Now, if you think about it, People can now go into space for holidays, right? Um, I think there's 5,000 people at this conference coming from all over the world. No problem. How do cells move a millimeter? Don't know. It shows you how complicated biology is. Okay, so back to what we're looking at. So notice you've got a growing domain You've got curvature, and it's in three dimensions. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we can ignore the curvature. We're going to assume that we can ignore the depth, and therefore we've got a two-dimensional sheet. And this two-dimensional sheet is growing. So the middle figure there, I mean, this is work from, from Paul's group, the growth occurs, roughly speaking, um, it grows one millimeter in, roughly speaking, 24 hours. So what we're going to do is we're going to have this rectangle growing along, and we're simply going to take as its growth a curve that fits that, um, uh, th that curve in the middle there, okay? So, if you have random, so we work very much from the case of start with the simplest model and build upwards. So simplest model would be cells delaminate from the neural crest and they, or from the neural tube, and they randomly move. That won't work because it will not give you the coherent stream movement. So the next thing is to say, is there a biased random walk? And it turns out that there's a chemoattractant called VEGF, which is produced by the overlying tissue. And cells consume VEGF, that creates a gradient, and they move up that gradient. So you've got the bias random walk, okay? So what we do then is write down a reaction diffusion, PDE, for VEGF, and I'll show you that in a minute, and we need boundary conditions along the corridor. When we started working on this, we had no idea what the boundary conditions should be, so we just made up boundary conditions. Either we have Dirichlet boundary conditions for the VEGF, that means that there's an internal gradient, so cells don't leave the, um, the domain, Later on, we did zero flux boundary conditions, so cells don't leave the domain, and our results are robust to those two boundary conditions. It turns out that actually, probably, 
those are not the correct boundary conditions. And Paul Kolesa will talk about that later on today in work that we just recently done, which has analyzed in more detail the boundary conditions. Cells, we will assume, are discrete entities. They randomly sample the domain. And if the VEGF concentration where they sample is higher than the VEGF concentration at the center, taking noise into account, they will then move in that direction. So this is the simplest possible model you could get for this behavior. So there's the PDE description. So we have um, the length is changing. So in x direction, there's the length changing. And in the y direction, there's no growth. We have internalization. We just assume that um, a cell which is at um, center at xi comma yi consumes the, the, the chemical. And then we have a production term and then a dilution term which comes about from the growth. So let's see if this works. OK. So now we see here the domain is growing. The cells are migrating. They're moving up the gradient. And um, this is looking really very good. The cells are invading. They're invading in a very nice chain-like way. And the problem is solved. So what are we going to do for the next 45 minutes, actually? Um, Oh, something's gone wrong. What's going on? Some of these cells have got left behind. Right, so it's not working. And the reason why it's not working is because the gradient is too um, narrow. So the cells at the back don't have anything to respond to. So it doesn't work. So then um, Louise Dyson, who was a student working on this, thought, well, the cells at the back, they see the cells at the front. So suppose they stuck to the cells at the front. Then what would happen? So in other words, suppose there were two cell types, cells at the front that move up the gradient, and cells at the back that grab hold to the cells at the front. And then you see you start getting these trails. So this is where we've used the model to, first of all, test a hypothesis and shown that that hypothesis doesn't work. Then we've generated a new hypothesis. And then we said, well, there must be at least two cell types. That's a prediction of our model. And then Paul and his colleagues went and tested, did um, gene sequence analysis, and they found that um, there were differences between the cells at the front and the back. And in particular, they were really excited by the fact that there were different cadherins upregulated at the front to upregulated at the back. And I'll have to be honest with you, when we were doing this, I didn't know what cadherin was until Paul mentioned to me, cadherins are to do with stickiness. And this upregulation means that the cells at the back are stickier than the cells at the front. So you know the model, your prediction that the cells at the back are more sticky than they are at the front? And I went, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, cadherins, of course, yeah, yeah, fantastic. I knew that. Of course, it's much more complicated than that. Biology always is. And you can see here there are different gene expression levels going on. And this is work we're still looking at. It's not just a case of having a binary cells at the front, different to cells at the back. It's more complicated than that. So this leads to the question, OK, do the cells at the front, and, well, the cells at the back, do they, um, is stickiness all that they do? Could it be that the cells at the front secrete a signal for the cells at the back 
to move. Could that signal be chemical? Or could it be mechanical? And Duncan will, Martinson will be talking tomorrow on aspects of the mechanics of this. Or could it be that the cells at the front create a tunnel so that the cells at the back sort of move through this tunnel? These are issues we're, we're still looking at. So we've done a lot of work with experimental validation of, of this model and um, things like what happens if you remove cells, what happens if you do cut and paste. I'll just show you, because of time, I'll just show you a couple of these. Here's one where what happens if you move cells at the back? And the experiment shows that the cells at the front, instead of being in quite a compact space, are now more widely spread out. And that's what the model shows, the mathematical model. Um, here's an example of what happens if you take cells at the back from a donor and stick them to the front of a host. And what the experiments show is that the cells at the front actively start to migrate. And that's not what the model predicts. Because the model predicts these cells, at the f these cells that we've moved are cells that are followers. So they've got nobody to follow now, so they'll just wander around and not know what to do. Whereas what actually happens is they actively move. And I'm a great believer that sometimes we learn a lot more about the biology when the model is wrong. Um, so what we did here then was say, well, OK, maybe there's phenotypic switching. So maybe the cells at the back, when you put them into a different environment, they change and they become leaders. And so we've done some work on that and validated that experimentally, which I won't go into. Now, a question then to ask is, how many leaders do we need? And we don't know that the model, I haven't mentioned parameter values here, because we only have parameter values sort of to several orders of magnitude. We don't have refined parameter values, so we can't make quantitative predictions. But we can make qualitative predictions. So a prediction we can make is, what would happen if you increased the number of leaders? So here on, on the bottom is um, the number of cells integrated along each x direction. And what you can see here, the um, top graph, the, the, the purple color, is normal. And then the bottom, the lower curve, is when we increase the number of leaders. So what you see is that in both cases, you reach the end of the domain, so invasion occurs, but there are fewer cells. And then on the other side, we see the picture of the, um, the, the actual experiments. So the green is the control, and the red is what happens when you upregulate the, the leaders make more leaders. And what you can see is you get invasion and you get fewer number of cells. So that's consistent with the model, but notice the numbers are totally wrong. It's not, quality, it's not quantitatively correct, which you wouldn't expect, but it's quantitatively, it's qualitatively correct. Okay? So one thing I skipped over here when I showed the, the new model, was that the leaders, some of them have got quite far away. They won't be able to signal to the followers. So it could be that the stream breaks up. Unless there's something controlling the, the leaders, their speed. And then what Paul found was the expression of something called DAN, which is in red here, which turns out to slow cells down. And DAN is expressed right by the neural tube. 
And as the leaders move through Dan, its expression disappears. So what we think is happening is the Dan is slowing down the leaders, and then it disappears and the followers can come in, catch up with the leaders. Now remember I said that an important aspect of looking at neuroprest is that it's a paradigm model for cancer. The next obvious thing to do is what happens if you now confront melanoma cells with um, Dan. And these are strips of Dan, and what you see is the melanoma cells, just like the neuroprest cells, tend to avoid Dan. Um, so they don't move as much. Okay. So there's an example of where, by doing some work on um, developmental biology, we can maybe get insight into what's happening in, in some disease. Um, so now going back to the issue of how do followers follow? So one idea we had here was that maybe the, I mean, these cells are moving through a matrix, some material with collagen and all sorts of other things. Maybe what the cells at the front are doing is that they're boring a hole. They're creating a track through the um, domain. And then the followers, as they randomly move, when they get into that track, it's easier for them to move. And then what Paul and his colleagues found was that the cells at the front upregulate something called aquaporin 1. And what that does is instead of the cells sort of randomly trying to find the direction to move in, these protrusions become more solid and bore a hole through the domain and create tunnels. And in fact, these are upregulated also in tumors. And so now we see if this works. So here's experiments. So at the very top is control. In the middle is when aquaporin is inhibited. And in the below is when the aquaporin is overexpressed. And then here the mathematical model is um, basically just reproducing those types of results. So it could be that th there's a tunnel being created by these cells at the front. So one of the, th the assumptions that we've made is that the domain growth is uniform in space. And the question is, is that true? So what we've got is that the domain is it's sort of growing in time, but it's not growing in, um, it's uniform in space. And it turns out that's not the case. Um, and Paul, what happened was that we met up with, um, a few years ago, met up with Hans Othmer, and he asked us, he said, you made this assumption. What evidence do you have to support that assumption? So Paul went back, checked his, um, you did some more experiments, and what they found was that there, I mean, although the, the cells we're following are hardly dividing, the cells in the domain, they're obviously dividing because the domain is growing. And they keep their density the same. So it means that you can correlate division with growth. And what you find is that division is not uniform in space. It's non-uniform in space. And so in this work that we did here, um, the, this paper here does the biology of all of that. And then um, here are some uh, modeling experiments of if you had the very top one, there's uniform growth. And then the next ones are different blocks of the domain growing at different rates. So that eventually you get the same size 
of domain, but in a non-uniform, in a, in a spatially non-uniform way. And what you see there is that it does affect the distances that the cells move. And this is work that we're still um, trying to uh, explore in more detail uh, because it does seem that the neural crest cells stimulate the growth, the division of the, of the mesodermal cells. In other words, the cells that are moving through the domain are stimulating the growth of the domain. And we're still trying to understand how that is going about. Okay. So if we sort of summarize what we've done so far, we started off with this idea that there's one cell type responding to a, a cell-induced chemical gradient. We've shown that that is not realistic. So there must be multiple cell types. And we took two cell types. There's also the question of, is it really two cell types? Or is it that cells have a number of behaviors? They can move up a gradient. They can grab hold of their friend and move along with their friend by sticking to them. And depending on where they are, they do one or the other. So that could be, you know, it could be um, each cell is a generalist that can do everything rather than being specialist um, leaders and specialist followers. So, I mean, we haven't ruled out one or other of those things. I mean, there needs to be a control so that the leaders don't move too far. It's still not clear what the signal from leader to follower is. Is it um, stickiness? Is it mechanical in terms of the, the cells affecting the mechanics of the environment they're moving along that sends a cue to the followers? And that's what Duncan will be talking about um, in, the, in, in the, the sessions later on. Um, or is it that the f leaders are creating pathways through which the followers can move? So there's a, and then, of course, the domain growth is not imposed from the outside. It's coming from the interaction between the moving cells and the domain. So you can see that almost at every level of, and I haven't mentioned the boundary conditions, and Paul will talk about those. Um, you can see at every level of our model, there is further complication going on. So time for another advert. Um, so we're presently um, looking to employ um, two uh, associate professor positions, one looking at um, uh, preference for somebody working in climate change, and the other one with a preference for areas relating to data-driven mechanistic modeling in mathematical biology. And so the deadline for those is um, noon UK time, Monday the 30th of January, and there's the, the, um, the, the website for you to get more details on if you're interested or if you know anybody who's interested, please do get in touch with them. So now I'm going to move on, talk briefly about cancer cell invasion. There's one thing I should mention with the neural crest is that the genes that they upregulate in order to invade are similar to the genes that are upregulated by cancer cells. Moreover, VEGF, the signal to which these cells respond, are also signals to which tumor cells respond. So many, many years ago, um, 1996, was this idea put forward by Bob Gatenby and um, Ed Galinsky, something called acid-mediated invasion 
hypothesis. And the idea here was that tumor cells use, uh, well, we've got a number of different pathways for energy. And one of those pathways is glycolysis. And that is less efficient at producing energy than other pathways. So if there's enough oxygen, you will use other pathways instead of the glycolytic pathway. But something called the Warburg effect is where you have that the tumor cells, even when there's lots of oxygen, use this glycolytic pathway. Which seems a bit of a contradiction because you're using it to generate less energy. But a byproduct of it is lactic acid. And lactic acid is more toxic to normal cells than to tumor cells. So this could be giving those tumor cells a competitive advantage. And what they did was write down this model here. So um, N1 here are normal cells. So this is non-dimensionalized. So the normal cells are just growing by um, logistic growth there. That's the first term. We'll come back to the second term a bit later on. Then we have the tumor cells, N2, that are grown logistically. And then we have omega, which is the um, lactic acid. So lactic acid is produced by the um, tumor cells. That's the delta 3 N2 term. And then it degrades. And then it diffuses. And the diffusion kills off the normal cells. And then the idea they put in was that, I mean, normal cells don't move, usually, unless there's a wound. And the tumor cells do move. And the idea here, I mean, I should talk, this is not in the embryonic, because obviously in the embryonic state, normal cells move, but not in the adult stage. And then the, the tumor cells, they put this idea that the diffusion of the tumor cells there had to be space available. So it had to be the case that um, the normal cells had to be brought down below their carrying capacity for the tumor cells to move. And what they found when they did this was that if you started off with all normal cells and then you put in some tumor cells, and in and, and the model, you got a traveling wave of tumor cells invading the normal cells. And because of, and the, basically the idea here was the tumor cells produce acid, acid diffuses, kills the normal cells, opens up space, and the tumor cells move in. Because of the nonlinearity, you get not a nice, smooth, fissure type wave, but you get a sharp wave. And you can either have coexistence of the cells at the back, or you could have a gap forming. And this is different to the traditional sort of lodka volterra competition model with diffusion, where there's always an overlap of the, cell, of the different species type. Here you get a gap. So the model predicted that in some circumstances should, there should be a gap. And then when they looked at some head and neck cancers, human cancers, they found such a gap, which denoted by the arrows there. Then they also did experiments with um, uh, sort of uh, spheroids. And in the spheroids, if you then measure pH, acidity across radii, you find that you get this nice gradient of pH that's predicted, predicted by their model. And then an obvious idea of this, what would happen if you um, applied bicarbonate? So this is a mouse uh, model where they, um, some mice are treated with carbonate, others aren't. And then you see that the, the um, untreated mice, there's a lot more metastasis than in the treated mice. 
So what we did, and this was work in collaboration with um, colleagues at the Moffat Cancer Center, um, so uh, Bob Gillies, who very sadly passed away last year, uh, Sandy Anderson, um, who's director of the mathematical oncology unit there, and also with a graduate student, who's now a postdoc, um, Maxi Strobel and um, Andrew Krauser. What we did here was ask the question that, could it be that instead of tumor cells having generalists, which are cells that can do everything, suppose they're made up of specialists, because it's known that tumor environment, tumors are highly heterogeneous. That's what makes them very, very difficult to treat. It's not all one cell type, because then you could just get some drug that could kill them all. They're very, very different. So could it be that in fact, these different phenotypes are working together? Rather than having one super generalist can do everything, maybe they're all working together. And you can see that's inspired from the um, Eurocrest work where you've got leaders and followers working together. And so what we did here was we sort of set up this type of um, sort of abstract idea where we said, let's suppose that you're a tumor and you want to invade and there's two barriers facing you. One barrier is the matrix, the extracellular stuff that you have to break down to move through. The other thing is the normal cells, the stroma, that are presenting a barrier. And let's suppose you've got one cell type, tumor cell type we call TM, that can degrade the matrix. And then suppose we've got another cell, tumor cell type, TA, that produces acid. So then the idea here would be that the stromal cells, so that's S, they um, grow with their um, normal logistic growth, and then they're killed by the acid, and the acid L is produced by the TA cells. And then the TA and the TM cells are engaged in a lot of Volterra competition between each other and the S cells, and those are the, the kinetics terms. But then they can move, but there's a matrix that's stopping them from moving. But then the um, TM, the, the tumor, the um, matrix degraders, degrade the matrix. And that's that minus KTMM term. Okay? So the results, and we do traveling wave analysis, and I'm going to go through that. The results are, are not particularly surprising. Uh, what we find is that if the dynamics of the parameters are such that you, that the lotka volterra type thing, kinetics gives you coexistence of the different cell types, then you end up getting um, invasion. Okay, so the cells are all mixed and they can invade nicely. However, if you have, because as you know with Lotka Volterra, you can get coexistence or you can get um, competitive exclusion where one cell, one species dominates the other species. If you get that, so either TM dominates or TA dominates, the net result is that you don't get invasion. Um, and, and there's a number of ways that can come about, um, which are illustrated there. Uh, and these results are not really um, surprising. And this picture I put up here is by no means a biological proof of this model. It's just to point out that these are pictures of some um, uh, a human breast cancer and the, the um, green things are 
those are cells that produce acid, and the purpley things are cells that produce, that degrade the matrix. And what you can see is they're sort of mixed up together. Okay. Um, so, I mean, obviously we need more data and need to look at this in more detail as to whether what's happening here is really what we're um, trying to, to do here. So one of the things that we're doing here, um, we're continuing working on this, is saying, well, could it be that these phenotypes are um, sort of uh, are, are in response to the environment? So again, not fixed, not leader follower, you know, um, acid producer, um, uh, matrix degrader, but could it be that depending on the environment, they could change their phenotype? And you could have phenotypic switching. So that's one thing that we're actually looking at at the moment. And in fact, preliminary work shows that if you take this model and you have phenotypic switching, you find that the mutual coexistence um, scenario becomes much more robust. And so the ability for these cells to invade becomes much more robust if you allow for switching. So lastly, um, I thought since this is a mathematics conference, I should at least mention some mathematical things in here. So what we did recently was um, take a very, very simple version of that model. So what we have in this very, very simple version of the model, so N is some cell, and um, M is some matrix, okay? Um, the cell degrades the matrix, that's a minus KMN term. term. Um, the, the cells grow logistically, and the matrix stops the cells from moving. Okay, and we thought, let's analyze that more thoroughly rather than doing numerical simulations. Now, as you know, if in that top term, if M wasn't in that term, then you would have the Fisher equation, which we teach to undergraduates, one lecture on the Fisher equation, traveling wave, nice smooth wave, we know the wave speed, um, unique wave speed, et cetera, et cetera, depending on initial conditions and all that sort of stuff. Um, it shouldn't be surprising that as soon as you tweak this by putting in a, um, this nonlinearity, things become much more complicated because now you have a um, cross diffusion term and also you have a degeneracy because of M is M max. That's a, that's a degenerate diffusion term. Moreover, the kinetics for the M term yield that if N is zero, M can be anything. So life becomes a lot more complicated. And this was worked with graduate student Chloe Colson, um, my longtime colleague, Faustino sanchez Gordonio, Tommaso Lorenzi, and Helen Byrne. And we based this work off some work that Ghislaine Messiah had done um, recently. So what we do, we look at this, and we do the usual, the sketch of the study is the usual thing, let's go to traveling wave coordinates and write it as a system of ODEs. And then let's look at um, steady states of those ODEs and then see if you can essentially in what is now a phase, three-dimensional phase space, get trajectories going from one steady state to another. The problem is that we have an infinite number of steady states here, makes life a bit difficult. And we do a shooting argument. And this is just showing you some of this shooting argument. I won't go into the detail of this. I'll spare you all the details of it. What you end up finding is that we can prove a, a theorem 
that there is a traveling, an invasive traveling wave that goes for where um, you go from having um, the cell invades the whole domain, clears away all the matrix, and um, what it turns out is that for any positive wave speed, you can get a traveling wave. So there's no minimum wave speed. Well, except the minimum wave speed is zero, I suppose you could say. Um, and then we find that because there's a continuum of steady states in M, with, with N equal to zero, M could be anything, that if you have far ahead of the wave, instead of the matrix being at its kind capacity, it's a bit below its kind capacity, then you get a traveling wave, but there is a strictly positive minimum wave speed. And that's a conjecture. We haven't proved that yet. Okay, so a subtle difference between whether far ahead of the wave M is at its current capacity or whether it's below its current capacity. And one thing I should mention here is that in a lot of cases when we do mathematical modeling in here is that, you know, you could look at this and you could say, well, you've got one minus M there. So you're saying that M is taking up space and that's stopping the cells from moving. And then if you look at the logistic growth, you could say the one minus M term is to do with the resource of space and N is taking up space. So natural question to ask then is, isn't there an inconsistency here? In the first term you're saying space is important, M takes it up. In the second term you're saying space is important, N takes it up. Well, what about M? And then the first thing, what about N? Okay. And in fact, if you look at most of the models in this area, including our models, they have those inconsistencies. So what we've done recently is do a detailed, fully um, volume structured analysis of these models. And in fact, what we found is that it's perfectly okay to do this, what we've done here. The results don't change if you make the whole thing more consistent, except for one singular case. So it is okay, although it looks like what we've done here and what lots of other people have done is inconsistent. It, it's actually not inconsistent. Okay, so what we've done there then is show how including a simple nonlinearity into the diffusion term really increases the complexity of the analysis of this problem. And one thing I would say is that there's a huge amount of work that's going on now on looking at how models behave in terms of your parameter sensitivity. This is a hugely important field. Um, if your model produces certain results and you change the parameter values, do you get the same behavior? And a lot of statistical analysis going on there. What's not being done so much is more the structural analysis of the model in terms of if you change the kinetic terms, I mean, I put one minus n times n in there, could be Gompertz, could be von Bertalanffy, could be lots of different models instead of one minus n times n. Likewise with the diffusion, it could be a non-degenerate, it could be a degenerate diffusion equation in n as well as in m, or it could be non-degenerate in n and degenerate in m. Does that make any difference to the solutions that we get? In other words, if we make these more complicated models 
either fully nonlinear or semi-nonlinear, how does the behavior depend on the nonlinearity? And I think that's a huge task and um, challenge for us as mathematicians to try and see what difference those make. Because when we're modeling at the population level and we use a certain nonlinear term, we're implicitly making an assumption of what's going on at the individual cell level. And if we change that assumption slightly, we get a different nonlinearity. And will that give you a completely different behavior? We don't know. So I think this is one of the challenges for the future. Um, how do we go about doing that? So what I hope, if there's two things to take away from, from this lecture, one thing is that mathematics can sometimes lead to some new insights in biology, maybe. But biology always leads to new, challenging, and exciting mathematics. So thank you for your attention. And just to point out again, don't please do try to come to the special session um, that Alexander Volkanin has been the major person in organizing that um, this afternoon and um, all day t tomorrow. And um, remember, look into this Newton Institute Mathematics of Movement, uh, which will start in, in um, July. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. I'm going to ask uh, a boring math mathematical question. You have all these traveling waves. Have you studied their stability? Nope. And, and in <laughs> fact, and this is a very important problem because I think that um, particularly in, in two dimensions, I think that's a hugely important problem because I think that um, uh, this is one thing I'd really like to do because in particular, uh, tumor cells, um, I mean, tumors, they, they sort of, um, they form these finger-like protrusions and stuff like this, and people have gone to a lot of trouble to make very complicated models that can give you that. And I'm wondering, could it be just this simple model and it's unstable? The front is unstable. So I'd really like to, to look at that. Yeah, I think it's really important. Yeah. And it's the thing that's missing at the moment from, from this field. Uh, yep, morning. You mentioned so many uh, slides, you showed so many slides about the cell movement, but how far practically a cell in a human body or animal, they travel in millimeters or centimeters, on an average, how far they travel? So, I mean, obviously with, with these cells, because it's in the embryo, so already length scales are, are rather small and we're talking about the, um, the um, a sort of mouse embryo or, or chick embryo. So these cells are moving, roughly speaking, a millimeter to get into the branchial arch, and then they will divide and etc. But of course, if you have things like um, uh, tumor development there, I mean, uh, as you know, you get metastases where you get secondary tumors that can be quite far away from the primary tumor but in that part of the movement comes from cells moving through the blood vessels. And what you find in things like brain tumors like glioma, I think cells can move quite a lot of quite distance uh, in, in that context. Okay. So it really depends what context you're, you're looking at. Thank yeah. you. And my second part of the question, the reaction diffusion models, of course they are very well known, but then in practice, when we apply in the human body, 
there is a lot of you know they don't move human body the parts are not uniform the organs are not uniform yeah. whereas the reaction diffusion however the complicated the model they only diffuse in a uniform way yeah. so are there any attempts to include the stochasticity a randomness part of the reaction diffusion so that they spread in a unorganized way Okay, well, that's a very important question. So one thing is that, that the um, brain tumor I mentioned, there the, the matrix is non-uniform. And so people like Kristen Swanson and Thomas Hill and people like that have done work of how the cells move through these different environments. Um, concerning the stochasticity, you're absolutely right, because if you look at like the Fisher wave, the Fisher wave is a pooled wave which means that the behavior of the Fisher wave is determined totally by what's happening at the front. And now as a mathematical entity and a mathematical um, study, that's perfectly fine. In a biological context, the one place where it's absolutely certain that the Fisher equation is invalid is at the front. So you've got a model whose behavior is determined at precisely the point where the model is invalid. And so people have looked at this by saying, well, what happens if we have far ahead of the wave, we have a stochastic model, and then far you know, behind the wave, we have a um, PDE model and how we link them together. And Alan Hastings gave a nice overview talk of that the other day in the ecology session. And there's a number of people who have looked at that and it's very important. And in fact, one thing that we're doing at the moment in the context of NeuroCrest with Duncan Martinson and my colleague Jose Carrillo and a student, um, Carlos uh, Falcao um, Grandia, is having leader cells being individuals and having the follower cells being a PDE and looking at how the interactions occur to see how the stochasticity has an effect. So that's, a, again, another very, very important complication and open problem. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so let's thank Professor Maney again. Okay, thank you.